Hi, my name is Charles Demink, and I'm the music director of the Oakville Chamber Orchestra. Today we're going to talk about Baroque music. So what do we mean by Baroque music anyway? Uh, Baroque is a specific time period in music history in Europe, uh, which lasted from about 1600 to about 1750. And uh, the word Baroque itself is applied to the style um, by people who came later, who weren't so terribly fond of it. It had passed out of style by that time. And so um, they got this name from the Baroque Pearl. I'm gonna show you a photo of some pearls now. You'll see that some are perfectly round and some are very irregular in shape. So this is the kind of, uh, this is what is meant by a Baroque Pearl, the irregular shaped ones. And so it's kind of casting negativity um, looking on a back on a musical style. But that's just, um, you know, somebody's opinion from a long time ago. And I think you'll find that Baroque music is totally great. And um, it goes far beyond music. Um, there's literature in the Baroque style and there's lots of art, probably some of your, which you're familiar. And the, uh, so I'm just gonna give you a couple of quick examples of Baroque art. Um, we're going to give you three or four examples from one of the world's most famous buildings, which is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And the artist is Gian Lorenzo Bernini. So Bernini is really one of the most important Baroque artists. And first of all, you're going to see the beautiful colonnade in front of um, St. Peter's. So, you know, this, this is the square where the big religious uh, gatherings are held. And, uh, you know, what would the area be without all these spectacular the spectacular columns that, that uh, defines the square. And as you see, there's um, uh, Baroque statues on top of every, uh, uh, you know, every few meters. Um, it's quite a spectacular thing. Looking inside the church, we have something called the baldacchino, which is the canopy over the main altar. And this is also by Bernini. And you see it's got all the spiral columns and it's got decoration everywhere. And this is like one of the main hallmarks of Baroque art is that it's highly decorated or ornamented. And this is something that passes on into Baroque music as we'll talk about a tiny bit later. Um, so then uh, lastly, we're gonna look at two different shots of the apse of St. Peter's Basilica. And so here's a, here's a distance shot. Um, we have the throne of St. Peter at the bottom of the screen, which is uh, the Pope's uh, throne. And above that, we have this spectacular Holy Spirit window. I'm just going to give you a close shot of that. You can see in the middle, we have a dove representing the Holy Spirit, and sunlight normally comes through that window. And you can see the truly spectacular radiating um, metal rays of, of sunlight, uh, you know, sunlight represented in metal, and all the various angels and birds, and it's just quite a spectacular thing. So you see the Baroque music is, or Baroque art, is about uh, sometimes about spectacular um, display, but it's also a lot of the time about ornamentation. And that's why it goes back to the idea of the Baroque Pearl. So now I'm gonna talk about a little bit about some of the most important parts of music in uh, the Baroque era. And I think probably by far the most important development was the uh, development of string instruments and the string orchestra as we know it today came into being at that time. Probably you've heard of Antonio Stradivari. In, in Latin they say Stradivarius when they talk about uh, his products, his spectacular violins and other inst string instruments that he made. He also made lutes and cellos, all kinds of different things. And um, so it's hard to underestimate the importance of the string orchestra in music history. And the string orchestra is totally with us today. It's something you've heard in all kinds of films. Basically today, any high budget film will have a, a symphony orchestra and the core of the sound of the symphony orchestra is the string section. And um, so, you know, all of this, for example, uh, John Williams, uh, movie music, it's all, his style is borrowed from not Baroque composers, but from later Romantic composers like Tchaikovsky and Mahler and Wagner. And so um, this is totally a living style and a sound that you're familiar with. Um, and so we're just gonna sh just remind you what uh, the different string instruments look like. Um, actually, I should mention, first of all, here's a photo of one of the most expensive uh, violins that has uh, ever been sold. Uh, in Canadian dollars, it sold for $16.5 million a, a few years ago. 
and uh, it's really that just this is not an unusual price for certain of the better reserved and uh, Stradivarius instruments. And uh, you may have heard of the movie The Red Violin, and this is a uh, you know uh, the 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 story of of the Red Violin is actually true. It really did go through a lot of the experiences that are depicted in the movie. It's a real violin, a real Stradivarius violin, and. Um, so this is, uh, you know, just an example of these priceless treasures that have come down to us. And in fact, um, to this day, nobody has really figured out how to improve on a Stradivari violin. It's uh, there. Uh, people think maybe that it's something about the water um, near Cremona, where the wood uh, that he was using um, is is from. It's just that excellent. Um, but certainly. Uh, they're some of the greatest uh, treasures of, uh, of world heritage. Uh, so uh, here's uh, somebody playing a violin. And then the slightly bigger friend of the uh, violin is known as the viola. Um, and you can see it's just a tiny bit bigger, and, but has a darker and slightly lower and richer sound than the violin does. Usually doesn't play as high. And uh, then we have a cello, which you see is um, rested on the floor with, this, with an end, end pin and uh, played in a completely different configuration uh, uh, than the violin and viola. As you notice, as the instruments get bigger, they have lower sounds. They produce lower pitches. And this is the same. doesn't matter. For example, a trombone produces lower pitches than a lower notes than a trumpet. This is a, you know, a, a trend. Uh, an acoustical fact, actually, when we're making musical instruments. And in the, ba the bass is the last um, lowest musical, or last but not least, uh, instrument in the string section. And um, the importance of this instrument to later music cannot possibly be underestimated. For example, I mean, in, uh, in pop music, the electric variety of the string bass is um, found in absolutely every rock band, every jazz band, every, you know, any kind of pop music you want, you will find this instrument in its electric version and sometimes in its acoustic version too. So, um, or electric guitar, this is what we usually call that. So those are the instruments of the string section. And uh, so now we're going to we're going to listen to another piece of Baroque music. At the beginning of this video, you heard the very opening of Vivaldi's Four Seasons, and you heard uh, the opening of Spring, uh, Spring, which is one of his most famous pieces. Now we're going to hear the end, the very end of the cycle, which is uh, the, end, the end of the first movement of Winter. And uh, this is a exa good example of program music, that is music that tells a story without words. So instrumental music that tells a story. In, in this Example, you'll hear the chattering of teeth. Uh, it's a very wonderful and exciting uh, piece that uh, Vivaldi wrote. This is Oakville Chamber Orchestra's own recording, uh, which we played uh, this year, just a few months ago, with uh, Veronica Manchur at the Oakville Center for the Performing Arts. <laughs> I just love that piece. Now we're going to talk a little bit about another important instrument in the Baroque orchestra, which is the harpsichord. The harpsichord is a lot like a piano. In fact, it looks just like a small piano, but uh, a small grand piano. But uh, the mechanism is a little bit different. Instead of uh, hammers, the felt cover covered wooden hammers striking strings, which is what happens in a piano, in the harpsichord, there's a little, uh, by now, nowadays, they're plastic, uh, but they used to be uh, made of quill feathers, um, and they pluck the instrument, they pluck the strings, so it gives quite a different sound. And uh, all of the recordings that you will hear today on this video have the harpsichord playing along uh, with the uh, orchestra. And uh, so we're going to give you an example of a solo piece uh, for harpsichord. Uh, Domenico Scarlatti was born in Italy, but spent most of his professional life in Spain. And he was uh, quite an innovator and a supreme player of the harpsichord. And he wrote um, 
uh, about 400 sonatas, short pieces for the harpsichord. And uh, the, a sonata simply means played in Italian as opposed to sung, which is cantata. And uh, so here's an excerpt of uh, a Scarlatti sonata. So the harpsichord, along with the bass instruments, like the cello and the bass, uh, and also maybe some wind instrument, like a low instrument, like bassoon, may uh, be called the basso continuo. So it means that means a continuing bass. And um, this is something that started in the Baroque uh, period, and it's kind of the anchor that hang hangs the whole thing together, sort of like the rhythm section of a jazz band. And uh, in fact, um, if you think about it, with a bass instrument, string bass instrument, like electric bass, as it, as it often is in pop music today, and a keyboard instrument, um, all you have to do is add drums and you have a rock band. So you can see that there's a real, a lot of the things that we consider completely normal in pop music today, and also classical music, were first established in the Baroque period. So we're going to talk a little bit now about one of the greatest European composers who ever lived, which was J.S. Bach. And he uh, was born in the small town of Eisenach in uh, 1685, uh, right around, in fact, in exactly the same year as Scarlatti and Handel, as we're also talking about uh, today. And um, we consider him to be such a great composer because of the tremendous compositional technique that was, he had that was probably better than anybody else. That's to say, his music was better crafted probably than anybody else. However, it's, uh, despite its technical excellence, it's still very accessible. People really like it. He was a major composer of church music, but right now we're going to listen to a concerto of his. Um, we're going to listen to part of Oakville Chamber Orchestra uh, playing his, uh, Brand the first movement of his Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 3, which is one of his most famous pieces. And just try and listen to see how many different parts there are going on in this piece and how wonderfully they sound together. And that's part of the joy of Bach. that uh, piece over at the Oakville Center for the Performing Arts just last year. Uh, it was uh, our 35th anniversary concert and we uh, really had a great time with it. Now we're going to talk about uh, another very famous uh, Baroque composer, George Frederick Handel, who's probably best known for uh, Messiah, which includes the Hallelujah Chorus. And um, he wrote a lot of operas, was more on the, I would say, you know, uh, kind of popular uh, style at the time than Bach was really focused more on uh, commercial success and uh, success on with uh, opera and also he practically invented the form of oratorio which is what Handel's Messiah is. Uh, we're just going to play you the hornpipe from his water music and the water music uh, just a couple of years after he arrived in London with his boss King George the first he, uh, the, the king ordered that he should have a very pleasant afternoon floating down barges from uh, Whitehall Palace up to Chelsea. And uh, he wanted Handel to write some music. And so he uh, wrote really quite a lot of wonderful music for this occasion, which is known as the, simply as the water music. A hornpipe is a dance that was popular at the time. And so uh, that'll be the last thing you hear on our presentation today. We really hope I, or I really hope that you've enjoyed what you've heard and uh, please feel free to contact with us and uh, interact with us online. Have a great day.